about the FMEA. I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I'm gonna, it's not going to take me too long. I'm going to go through an example, and then we're going to have you guys, um, maybe after we eat, we'll see what time the food comes and such. We'll have you do an exercise so you can kind of get a feel for the tool. And um, helps you remember it hopefully a little bit better, and maybe you can use it um, back at work, find it useful. So um, let's just go through our agenda a bit. First, um, I'll go through the abbreviations that I have throughout the presentation so that you might remember what they mean when I get to them. Um, the FMEA, as Mary said, that'll be, the, that'll be the first one we go through. We'll talk about what it is, why we might want to use it, what the steps are, um, how you use it, um, then Megan is going to go through another simple risk assessment tool that she's used and that's come in handy for different things. Um, then we're going to do the exercise as I said and then maybe we'll have some discussion. So here are the, um, the abbreviations that I have in the presentation. FMEA stands for Failure Mode and Effects Analysis. I'm sure you've heard of it before. Um, in the FMEA, one of the things that we talk about is the severity, um, that's abbreviated SEV. Occurrence is OCC, detection, DET. And we also talk about the RPN number, which is the risk priority number, which is your severity times your occurrence times your detection. All right, so you'll see those abbreviations. And I'll remind you, but just so you kind of have an idea. Okay. So what's the purpose of um, an FEM, FMEA? Really, I think the primary thing is that you want to evaluate any risks associated with your process, any process. Um, I actually went on um, ASQ's website and they brought up a, a couple of good points about the FMEA and we put a link in the, in the presentation to this page on ASQ's website. What they say is it's great to use an FMEA either when um, you're designing a new process um, with an existing process that you're applying in a new way, before you develop control plans for a new or modified process, when you're trying to improve an existing process, or when you're trying to see what's failing in an existing process, or periodically you might want to do it. Because what the FMEA is going to help you do is to identify any risks in your process. So if you haven't done that already, you might want to do an FMEA. Or if the process is new, you might want to do an FMEA. If you do major changes, you might want to do an FMEA. It's pretty nifty. I enjoy it. It happens to be one of my um, more favorite um, Six Sigma type tools. So um, I enjoy talking about it. I'll talk about it all night if you want. <laughs> So um, it's, it's a structured way. I think that's kind of what I like about it. It really, the tool itself, and you'll, um, there's a lot of um, templates out there that are they're pretty similar. Um, we'll show you the one that, that we use. Um, but I haven't seen a, a lot of big differences in the templates. I went out there today to see what you guys might find. If you're searching around for an FMEA template, they're pretty readily available. And they look pretty much like the one I'm going to show you tonight. Um, they facilitate you improving your process. So when you're looking at the steps of your process, going through the FMEA steps, you're kind of saying what could happen at that point, and you're identifying what you might want to do if that should happen. So while you're identifying your risks, you're kind of looking at how to improve it as well. And it has everything together, allowing you to kind of organize that whole project. Um, what's the problem, and what am I going to do about it? And who's going to do it, and by when? So that, that's what I kind of like about it too. It's like an all-in-one tool like that. Um, so just kind of going into, so it can facilitate process improvement, but it's really going to help you identify the ways your process can fail. And then what it does is it helps you rank which failure possibility is your most, your biggest, the most severe, the worst. Um, so you're, you're going through, you're identifying any risk with each step. And then also, it's one of the other pieces of it is you're actually looking at what controls you might have in place already. Do you have a current control in place? And how effective is it? It's 
It's also one of the things that it does. And it lets you prioritize all of that. So um, let's start looking at it a little more. So here's the steps. I'm going to put those in front of me. But I'm going to go through the steps where you can see the document. So this is what um, the left-hand side of the FMEA template looks like. I don't know if this, this isn't exactly huge. But what this first part is, is what your process step or function is. So really, the whole, the whole document is based on the whole project that you're doing in the FMEA is based on what your process steps are. That's the first thing you're going to do. And so for, you, for those of you who are familiar with Six Sigma tools, quality tools, you can use a process map to go through your steps, um, any kind. We like to use, you can use like the SIPOC, like your high level process steps, or you can use a detailed process map or to use detailed process steps. It's kind of up to you. So, so that's the first. So your first step is going to be what, what is the process step that you're analyzing. All right, so that's your first step. Next, in what way could that process step fail to meet the requirements? So that's going to be potential failure modes. And that's what you're identifying in that column of the sheet. The third column is the potential effects of those failure modes. So what's the effect on the outputs of that happening? That, now this is when we get into severity, SEV that I said to you earlier. So how severe would be? How would severe is that effect to the customer? If that failure happened, how bad would it be? And we have, um, we have um, scales, one to 10. So I'll tell you what would a one be on severity, what would a 10 be? So 10 is gonna be the worst. So you know, death and dismemberment, definitely a 10. If that's gonna happen, <laughs> it's a 10. If, if people ha would hardly notice, that'd be like a one, that kind of thing. Potential causes is the next column. So what caused, um, and as we go through the um, example, I think this will all make a lot more sense. So what can go wrong with it and why does it happen? What's the potential causes? The next column is the occurrence. So if, if that's the potential causes, how often would that happen? So a 10 would mean like it happens every day where a one would be, maybe it happens every three years. That kind of thing. Next, I, I talked earlier about any current controls that you have in place. This is where you would identify any current controls. So how could you find out that this happened? Do you have any controls in place that would let you know that this failure happened? So if you do, and you can detect it really well, that would be like a one. If you don't and you would have no idea, that would be a 10. So then you can see when I talked earlier about RPN, risk priority number, if, it's, if there's death and dismemberment, it happens every day and you have no idea, it's 10 times 10 times 10. <laughs> and that would be, that would go right up to the top of you to evaluate. Makes sense, right? So a little bit more about the risk priority number. It's what the output, it's really what you're going to use to kind of prioritize what you should look at first. Um, it does, it's going to calculate based on the information that you provide to the tool about what can fail, what the effects of that failure are, and if you're able to detect it. So that's what the RPN is based on, and it's just one times the other times the other. So I think, what's that, 1,000? thousand would be the highest score that you could get. That would be bad. So then what happens is you'll sort it in um, descending order and then that's when you start to, to go through the second half of the um, FMEA which is where you talk about what kind of action should we take. So before we get into that second part of the FMEA I wanted to do a little example. And we're going to use making coffee 
as an example. So here are some of the inputs and outputs that I've identified for this example that we're using to make our coffee. So we have filter, measured coffee, whatever the type of coffee is, the quality, the quantity, quality of the water, the temperature of the water, time, altitude. Outputs are going to be hot, fresh, good tasting, right price. So here's a little process map that we're going to use for our example. Here's some of our steps. We clean the equipment. Here's some of our inputs to cleaning the equipment. We insert the filter. We add coffee. We add water. We perk the coffee. And we have a warm coffee urn and we get good tasting hot coffee out of it. So this process map happens to show some of the inputs and outputs of all of the different steps. Just happens to be a process map with a little extra details. So that's what I used for the, in, the uh, input to the example. So here would be that first part of the FMEA that I just went over, using the making coffee as an example. So that first process step, remember, was clean equipment. So one of the potential failure modes identified was that the equipment isn't clean. So what if it failed in that way? What, could, what would the potential effects be? Bad tasting coffee. So the causes of that could be, so notice they've identified a number of causes under these, this same process step and potential failure mode. They've, they've identified a, a number of them, and that's okay. That should be what happens. So this could be because there wasn't enough water, because there was residual soap, there was insufficient scrub time, insufficient rinse time. So then what would happen is you would identify each of these. Do we have any controls to catch any of that? Okay? How severe would bad tasting coffee be? How often does it occur? The next process step is inserting the filter. One of the failures that could occur is that that filter is not centered. What could happen in that case is we can get grounds in that coffee. So what would be the causes of that? The filter not installed on center, filter slipped, the filter the wrong size. So do we have any controls that we could catch any of those things with? Next, adding grounds to coffee, too much. So we have too much coffee we put in the machine. The potential effects, we have a couple here, is too strong coffee or grounds in the coffee. Potential causes, not measured properly, um, poured in too much, that's the same one there. Um, adding grounds to coffee again, we could do too little grounds, and that would make, mean our coffee was too weak. Again, that we, that we didn't measure it properly. So do we have anything that could identify um, that this happened? All right, so that's the idea of it. Then what would happen is then you have to go back and say, okay, if this happened in our process, how severe would that be? One to 10. Here's our causes. How often do they occur? So what's been our experience in having, where we found we didn't have enough water? How often is there residual? So how often have we found these things? So you have to do some measuring here too, right? And then once you've identified any of your current controls, how good are they? Then the last thing is how good are they at detecting the problems that you've identified? Okay. You good so far? Good. Anything you want to add? Okay. So once you've gotten that first part of the FMEA done, I mentioned that there is kind of a second half of it. This is what the second half looks like. You take those three numbers, the RPN number, and you put it here. You do your multiplication, and you put your results in this column. And then you uh, sort descending. And then you say, OK, so now here's my most severe thing. Um, what are you going to do with that? It's bad. If I have, you know, if it, really, if my process has that big of a risk, if you've got 1,000 out there, that's really bad. What the heck are we going to do? So what are the actions that we want to do? Um, now, usually, we usually can't affect the severity, right? Usually that's pretty much, if this happened, it's really bad, 
there's really not a lot of ways we can change that one, but we can, we might be able to change how often it occurs, right? Or we might be able to change how we can, if we can detect it. So if it does occur, we want to either make it occur as seldom as possible, number one, that'd be great. Number two, if it does occur, we sure as heck want to know what happened. So that's the kind of stuff to concentrate on here in your actions. How are we going to do that? How are we either going to make it happen less often or know that it happened? Boom. Who's going to do it? When they got to do it by? Once that happens, you follow up and now let's reevaluate where we are now. So we put this in place, we took our action, now what's our, our severity might be the same, but maybe it's occurring less often or we can detect it. And now we've got a new RPM and now we can go to the next thing. We, we took care <coughs> of it. Okay? So, the whole, so that's what I mean, that it, what I like about this is that it really gives you an opportunity to look at the whole picture and really follow up follow up and then reevaluate where you are and now you've got it's like a living and breathing thing. It's not some, it's not one of those tools that you really put in the drawer and forget about. You really can keep this going and really keep an eye on what's happening. The, the only thing I, I was trying to think when possibly can you change the severity of something and where we don't do it, but um, we're in the pharmaceutical we're in the pharmaceutical um, industry and one of the things to reduce death possibly by testing a new drug was introduced testing on animals. I know a whole political experience on that but that's one of the few that I can think of that you could ch actually change the severity um, by doing a mitigation but generally like we do a lot of lab testing it's an incorrect result that has a, a, a bad effect so that no matter what it's still an incorrect result so changing the occurrence or the ability, the worst possible thing is making a very severe error happening often and you don't know what's happening. That's, you know, you have no chance to rectify it before it reaches its end destination. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right, so what do you think? It's kind of my summary of my FMEA. I can, I'll, I'll do my summary points, but do you have any comments or questions? Has anyone ever tried it before? It's, yeah? Do you love it? She does, she's smart. Oh, I can smile. I used to work in the automotive industry and we did a lot there. Yeah. But yeah. I now work in the hospitality industry, so it's been interesting on how I can use it. Well, it's definitely different in a, in a more service industry, right? But I think, but I think you can, because I think you can use it on any process. Um, I know that I've used it, um, I've used it in a number, a number of different areas. I'm trying to think if I've ever used it on something that's pure service. Well, it's a, and it's a simple concept. I know Kerry's gone through it very quickly, um, because the concept is very simple. Trying to do it, it, it takes a lot longer than it just yeah. took me to talk about it. It, <laughs> it can get very detailed depending on the process you're looking at. We're keeping it to very simple processes. Our exercises on a very simple process because um, you can get very detailed. It's also subjective. So one of the things I always recommend is that you include all the employees that touch that process, or at least a representation from that. So in your case, because it's service, you might want to have some people from each area, which normally wouldn't interact with each other, but they all touch that process. We did, um, actually Carrie was an example, of, we used to work together, we know it right now, but one of the things she was doing was an FME and our accessioning process, and it was basically our intake process, and she got people in the room who weren't necessarily doing the process and they're like, okay, when can we get an incorrect test? And they're like, oh, well, you know, when the system goes down every hour for that 15 minutes, sometimes it kicks you out during the time. And, you know, the other people in the group were like, what? You know, so it, it was really helpful in that case because they didn't know the system went down for 15 minutes. IT did and they did, but management was able to move that later on in the day. So. That um, is one example. I also had an example where we had a number of quality issues 
And the general manager came to me, who's actually in our Dublin facility, and said, you know, we're good with these couple of quality issues. I feel we've addressed it, but we have many more instrumentation in our lab. How do I know that we've gotten it? So what we did was an FMEA on every instrument. So, but I mean, but you know, it was reams of paper and lots of people, but it, it really um, took a long time, but it was beneficial. So a couple of, a couple of things. If whatever it is you're doing an FMEA on, if it's new, if it's a new thing, and you're looking at, well, what could the causes of the difficulty be? I guess you have to start with either assumptions or things that, right. You know, or maybe research that you've done into similar things, and then it becomes more accurate as you have the experience with the right. process or whatever it is. And this is one of those ones, once again, because of the subjectivity, you want to have those people in the room like, oh, this could happen, this could happen, because it's all about potential. But then you do get to a level where, you know, we could have an earthquake, we could have this, you know, so you have to kind of level set it. It can go, you know, pretty far. I don't follow up. So, um, the result of it could be to reevaluate the whole thing. Right. So if you're that, doing it on a new process, generally you've created your process. I'm sure in the auto, automotive industry, and then like, okay, now we're doing this. Where can it? Where can it go wrong? What can happen? Um, so a, a lot of times in designing a new process and design for Six Sigma, the simple process. I'm going to a simple risk. I actually did on a, a small design for Six Sigma project, very small service kind of thing. Um, but that's when you want to say, okay, we don't have experience on this. We want to not roll out something that's going to blow up. How can it possibly blow up? I mean, a lot of engineering um, concepts are built on that too. I mean, we're, we're talking about the Six Sigma, but it's been around in engineering quite a while as well. This came right out of engineering, the FMEA. Just stole it, repackaged it, <laughs> using it for something else, just like we do all the other quality tools. It's good. That's why it's stayed around for so long. Another example of a project that Kerry did was there was a, a process that was going from one shift to another. So it was going from a day shift to a night shift. That's a good example. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, what can happen? Because we know we have a big risk because we're moving from one to the other. So getting the people together from both of those, uh, air, those shifts so you knew, okay, when I come in, I do this. Well, what if you don't come in today? You know who then gets it, and, yeah. and it, that was another example. Yeah, we used. I think we kind of used it. We identified. We even like as we put things in place, we used. We reevaluated because we out of that project, we wound up putting a process in place. How do you do a shift handoff? Um, actually, it was that project. That was a really good project. It was. Um, we actually copied it from another of our um, sister laboratories that was doing it, and. Um, they, it, it used the FMEA, so there was a really good um, framework that made it a lot easier. It's probably why it was one of my favorite FMEA projects because it wasn't as painful as some of them are because it's hard to go through this and it takes a lot of time. Um, people come up with a lot of things um, and then there's a lot of arguing, well that's really bad and that occurs this often and you know there's coming up with the numbers and everyone feeling comfortable with what you have sometimes can take some time. Because we had a framework in that case, it was really nice and I think the instrument one benefited from that as well because you, when you start with something, yeah. um, it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. With the instrument one, the first thing they did was go and process map. So they had these huge process maps. You know, so you can imagine if you take a really big, they actually did it on computer paper, um, and then tilted it to where you have to do what could go wrong with each step, in exponentially. So another hint is to make sure you fill out every line. You know, Carrie had some blanks on there, because when you sort, you kind of lose those process steps. So you want to, uh, it looks better on a presentation, but you want to make sure fill in when, you, yeah. when you sort it. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. We've all lived through that pain. So let me see just here in my summary. Um, yeah, you know, really your process, the process map or an SOP is going to really be your um, starting point for the FMEA. Um, and you're going to come up with things that you just want to do and you should just do them. Um, don't be. Um, If you're doing if you're doing a project or if you're thinking about this in a Six Sigma manner, um, you know you're definitely going to have some data collection to do. Um, 
especially around um, how often, how severe things are, perhaps how often things happen. Um, and that can, that can actually help you um, later on in your project as you're looking at improving and even in your control phase, remeasuring um, how often things are happening. And the FMEA will take you right through that. Um, it really will. It's, uh, it's, I've, I've actually, I've gone through the whole DMA process just doing an FMEA project because it really does, it, you can, you know, you can start with a process map, you're defining, you're defining your process, you're doing your measuring, um, you know, you're analyzing, you're putting, you're taking improvement actions and then you can use the FMEA to, like, as your control plan as well. Right. Maybe we'll we'll take a. Well, we could do. It. Yeah. yeah, we could just. Have. I think we just have your part. Yeah, and then we can do the uh, exercise after. We do. So um, when Carrie and I were talking about doing this, um, I had used a, very, a simpler uh, risk assessment tool on a very small project that I did. Um, but it's one of my projects that has lasted the longest. It's, it's funny that uh, often you know, how processes and things change. So we were talking about that. And we'd be very, you know, I'd love to hear anybody else um, like to have discussion at the end, any pro any risk assessment tools that anybody else might use or encounter because um, not every single one you can use for each one. So this we use basically to do a, a project, an event, or a process, small process. So the steps would be to brainstorm any obstacles. So I'll show you, just really just write a list of what can happen. I was doing a standalone project. It was actually designed for Six Sigma, and where I got this from was the Wrath and Strong little hand uh, book I had gotten training. There was no, you know, it was FMEA, but this was actually in the Wrath and Strong uh, pocket notes for a design for Six Sigma. So the key, same thing, you evaluate the probability of this happening. What would the, the impact be on the project if this would be happening? So instead of a 10 rating scale, it's low, medium, high. The same thing with the probability of it occurring. Um, use the grid to assign the risk. And um, it's color coded, I'll show you in a second. And then identify the mitigators. So it's really very similar to MFMEA, but it's a little bit simpler. So here's the grid. Um, so the impact on the project, low, medium, high. The probability that this risk or thing that you think might happen will happen, and the same thing, and what you should do for the steps. So here's the example of the process I did. At the time, um, I was, actually I was working in a lab then too, but we were putting in a process to evaluate our payments from our carriers, our insurance companies. You know, it's um, very complex what different carriers, and we had hundreds of them, uh, the I went to work for Quest Diagnostics at this time. So we were putting this process in, and it was new, and I was a, a, six, a dedicated Six Sigma person. So one of the first thing I recognized is we're gonna need resource for this. It's a new process, we've never done it before. So this is great, I'm gonna design it, maybe I'm gonna do it, and then there's not gonna be anybody to hand it off to. So that ended up to be my biggest risk for the whole project. So, um, you know, the rating category was do not proceed until you do that, because I could build the best process and it, if nothing. So um, it, finance had to resolve the resource issue, make sure that we had a budget for it, and a staffing plan had to be established. So that remained red for quite a while. So, and then, like the FMEA, this was a living, breathing document. I kept going back, and as I went through these uh, obstacles before I rolled everything out, I kept reassessing what the actions were. So another example was uh, the documentation was off-site. That was a risk. The billing at the time was being done off-site, you know, and this was um, eight years ago. Scanning wasn't as readily, uh, wasn't as good as it is now. Resource versus payoff. Was this gonna was this gonna be worth it? Was it were we gonna find money or were we gonna reduce our risk of incorrect billing by doing it? So some of the things like for that, you build the measure into the process. As we start doing this, we have the resource. What is that resource benefit? IT constraints, 
Um, so that one was a high and high, and because we had a, a big IT queue, um, it was we could go to paper if we had to. It wouldn't be as good, but we did could then automate a second phase. And then one that I didn't have to worry about in regards to the project was capitated contracts with our insurance companies. You know, um, they could change. So wanted to make sure, so when I assessed it was low, low, we just needed, needed a mechanism to make sure we knew that happened. And that was really it. We just, we just didn't fold into the project. So this, went, this is about half of everything I found. So, but this is a nice, simple way of just doing another one. If you're, you know, it's not much different than if you're planning, say, a backyard party. You know, what if it rains? What's the probability of it happening? What if it's cold, you know? Um, what if the food doesn't show up? That kind of thing. So this is a simpler one. Uh, the FMEA can get very uh, detailed, and this is one on a, a very small spreadsheet. Any questions about this? Okay, great. So we're gonna take a few minutes to eat, and then we're gonna get you going on an exercise. So, because it's difficult when you have a rating scale for manufacturing, it's difficult to try to apply that to um, a service process. And people sometimes get very caught up in trying to interpret that instead of really do, working on the FMEA, which is what we should be doing. We're, we're trying to kind of interpret the rating scale. So, um, actually for our exercise today, the rating scale that we're using is really more um, service driven. So um, I'm gonna we're gonna pass these out and you'll you can take a look at them. I think we have one for everything. Right? Yeah, okay. So I wanted to say that. Um, so the, and there there's other ones out there. Yeah, there's tons. If you yeah, yeah if you them. search for them, there's um, many 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 different rating scales, and you can find your favorite. I do like this one. This is a good one. Usually applies to more. Yeah, it applies. It, yeah, and it, yeah. And that's what will happen. Maybe you'll find one that works well for you and you'll keep using it. So um, we're going to pass, we're going to do an exercise and we'd like you to get into groups of maybe five? Three, 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 yeah, three to four, five, you know, something like that. Um, or more if you want, whatever, however many, four you guys got back there, that's fine. And um, I'm going to hand, we're going to hand out the, the steps of the FMEA. So you'll have that in your handout. Everybody will get a handout. And then um, I'm gonna, we're going to have the process that you're going to be working on. And the process that we're going to do an FMEA on is where we manufacture peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Okay, so here's your process steps. And so I have, we have um, actually Vegan. Vegan was kind enough to put this together. At the bottom we have, um, this is a side pop in case anybody's not familiar. And at the bottom you have the high level steps. So that's what you could use to be your process steps of your FMEA. Okay? And then here is, oh sorry. The last page is the FMEA template. It's kind of small, so we were, um, we have uh, um, desktop uh, pads so that you guys can do the FMEA on here if you'd like because this is a little bit small for you to use. So each group, we can give each group one of these. And I'd just like you to try a couple of the process steps. I, I don't expect you to do a complete FMEA in our few minutes um, of your of our peanut butter and jelly making um, process. But I'd like you to try, give it a try and um, be ready to report out. Maybe we'll do, what do you think? 20 minutes, 20 minutes sounds good. So the idea is to understand the process, number one, and then identify what could happen when you go from, because this process is that kind of process is custom. But each time you move, you want to know what could happen to keep this process from going to the next step. Right. Exactly. So. Right, that's another way. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's supposed to it's marmalade. It's what? It's marmalade. <laughs>
Yeah. Cross contamination. Okay. Um, yeah. Isn't that the purpose? Isn't that the purpose? What if you do that? No, no, you can cross contaminate with the. Uh, it's like the you got the peanut butter on the chocolate. You got the chocolate on the peanut butter. Are we ready to cut? Are we ready to cut? It's not cold. Damn. So again, here we see we have two different out, um, outcomes for the one cause. Which can happen. There's not enough bread. Small sandwich. Okay, so how did it go? Pretty good? You got through it? Yeah. A lot more detailed than you would expect. I mean, I see a lot of writing for making peanut butter and jelly. You could do it probably about 15 seconds. Could you imagine the process that takes days or hours? How many lines and how many things can go along? So you can understand this can get exponentially really big. So where did you have trouble? Did anybody struggle on anything? Just starting with it. Starting? Just getting, okay, focusing on what we're going to do. But then once we got it, we we'll Yeah. 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 And then the occurrence also, like how often yeah. occurrence. Happen. Yeah. And, then, and that goes back to the subjectivity of it mm -hmm. because everyone has a different opinion on how often something happens or how severe it is. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did, because when we did that instrument project that I spoke about, um, the quality improvement person, what he would do is get the team together. He would do a little training. These are actually slides from the training he did. Um, talk to them about FMEA. He would do the process mapping with them because everything wasn't process mapped. And then he'd go over the rating scales. So you get consensus on the rating scales before you start any of the, the items. And it really kind of gets everybody in agreement. But you will have a lot of discussion often on that, you know. Um, and feel, I would say, and we've done it, change the scales to what you want it to be. You know, if, it, if it's, I know you're talking about service, if it's a customer complaint, that's your number 10, then scale it from that. Um, because hopefully you're not going to have death in the hospitality industry. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of thing. Feel free to do it, but get agreement of the team. Go over, I would go over it with them. You know, um, so that, that's a suggestion for the scales. Now, did anybody have any problem thinking about what possibly could go wrong? You start down that trail and what happens, right? What happens? Did you have problems thinking what could go wrong? What'd you say? No, I say it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, oh, that could go wrong. Oh my goodness. And this, you know, I sat down with this group. I was like, okay, so tell me some things. I said, what about getting the peanut butter in the jelly jar on the jelly in the peanut butter? Some people that really bothers, you know, so <laughs> it depends on, so that also is about requirements. What are the requirements of your customers or your, your end user? You know, in the, in the SIPOC, I, I think I only had kid as the end user, but really maybe the parents or whoever the chef is also, or the owner or the keeper of the materials might be also a customer of the process because they, they maintain those things. So what are some examples? What, what was the, uh, let me look at, so for the first step in the process, so this, this is yours, this isn't the one. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, here it is. This is it. Okay. Someone give me something from put the bread on the plate, I think it was, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so what's one line item? Can one team go through a line item for put bread on the plate? Volunteers. 
Okay, Debbie over here? Yep. We said, yeah, I don't have any bread. You don't have any bread. So then what was your... Uh... So you want to go up there? Yeah, I'm going to look at... So then what, what was your uh, risk mitigation for that? Or well, potential causes. What were some potential causes for that? Potential causes for no bread. Um, you didn't go to the store. The store was out of stock. You forgot to put it on your list. The bread you had was moldy. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> what, and just for our grins, what was your RPM number on that item? That was the highest. And because the severity was 10, because you couldn't have a sandwich. Right. right. So that was total breakdown of the failure. Mm -hmm. And did you, did you come up with any risk mitigation for that? Um, risk mitigation. We said, I said, uh, always have a backup store. And then, or we said, um, set up pea pods so you never have bread out of stock. Or you can go to a Costco or BJ's and buy in bulk. <laughs> freeze it, maybe freeze it. Yeah. Great. And so, what did you get? Recalculate a new RPM number? No, we didn't get. Okay. We didn't get to that. Anybody else have an item on that list that you want to? I'm just going to torture you though until you give me something. So, how about and you have one? Moldy bread. See, that's why I go to the freezer because I don't go to the bread that often. It's there, but it's not. Right. And that had the highest severity. Yeah, it's messy. And um, what did we say to mitigate? Oh, we said, for example, seal the bread in Tupperware <coughs> to reduce that. When we found moldy bread, we, you know, we went through uh, uh, you know, progression. And said, hey, what about moldy bread? It was like an add-on at the end. Yeah, you start giving it. It really is like a brainstorming. And that's why I say it's subjective, so make sure with most subjective tools, because uh, we have a, a few, we, what we're doing is making it objective because we're making it numbers, but to get those numbers, it's subjectivity, to make sure you have representation. So in this case, you may want to have the kid on the team or whoever you're making the bread, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich for, because they might say, I don't care. I don't care. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I need those edges cut or whatever, you know, their requirements are. Um, but you want anybody who touches the process, you, you try to have there. The stakeholder is great. Yeah. Great. Okay, so how about adding peanut butter? Does anybody have any problem with peanut butter? This team? I'd feed him. What did you say? I'd peanut butter. I'd peanut butter? And what might be some of the drivers of that? The, uh, Expired date. Expiration date. Is there an expiration date? I know this is sad. Is there an expiration date? Uh oh. I don't mind. I know the salad. <laughs> yeah. I know the salad dress that I have a problem with. I better go check my computer. <laughs> so then, what was some of your action? Was it a high RPM number? Get into calculate. Did you come up with any mitigation? Inventory, inventory control. control. <laughs> inventory control. <laughs> Check those seeds. You're going to know if those seeds exist. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, it, and it's a silly thing, and that's why we use silly things. But it really, you start thinking about it. So many of the products we use have expiration dates or have thresholds of when the, the optimum time it is that we would use it. I mean, there's many products in the lab industry, our reagents, you know, there is a time frame, there is expirations, and it will affect the outcome. So, uh, I know we're making fun, but, okay, so how about Angeli? You guys back there? All right, uh, you have the wrong flavor. Wrong flavor. Uh, Cross-contamination. Uh, it can be too soft, it can be too hard. Uh, you could have uh, spoiled jelly. Um, too little jelly, too much jelly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the, we had a couple of things that you could puncture the bread and that's sort of coming out of it too hard. If the jelly, if you're spreading it. Um, you don't have a clean knife or spoon, which also can lead to the cluster contamination. Um, and then un uneven distribution is the last one for the uneven jelly types. Yeah, that's the one. I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> we have an expert. I'm thinking. And, and, and temper tantrum as a result is an 800. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 
there are no controls or mitigation available. Especially with the last two pieces of bread. No, that I've covered. Oh, you're I'm good on the Kanban. So. <laughs> That's great. So what are some of your risk mitigation that you might have covered? Uh, most of it comes from uh, visual or, or stocking, um, putting it in the freezer, that's what we do. Always have extra. Using a bread box, it seems to keep the bread longer. Um, we have a pantry, so we have extra jelly. Um, easy. Adjusting the fridge temperature to make sure it's accurate. You ask for it, that's dad's job. You know, we had a, you have mitigation. The stuff we do normally, but when you write it down, it's fine. All right, now cutting the sandwich. You guys have something on cutting the sandwich? Cut your hand. Cut your hand, right? So there's a safety risk there. That's right. Now that, what was your RPM on that? Did you calculate? Well, low, because, you know, we're experienced sandwich cutters. So, so <laughs> your occurrence is low. Your severity is pretty high on that, right? Yeah. Might Don't mom get blood return in to the jail. hospital, and you have to redo your whole product. Um, <laughs> but the occurrence is probably low. But your detection is also very low, right? You know when that happens. <laughs> yeah, that's not something that's going to slide through, like you know, an extra lump in the bread, and then you have the temper tantrum after. Right. Great, great. All right. Now, what about wrapping? Uh, did anybody do about the cutting the wrong kind of cut? Diagonal versus straight? Crust versus no crusts? You know. What did they say? Asymmetrical. Yeah, you end up with that little, you know, triangle. I have a husband that doesn't like to cut. I have one daughter that it must be cut on the diagonal. Right. And I have another one who doesn't really care how it's cut, but she can't have any crusts. Well, we have Just very crust challenging crust to make sandwiches in my house. If you leave off the crust for one, they're mad. If you get off for the other, they're mad. Yeah. So you got to make sure. Yeah. And of course, you can't just say, take your brothers or sisters, because that yeah. doesn't go. Yeah. 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 Well, the same thing with our customers. You can't say, Oh, but we got it right for them. Oh, we should just give you theirs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, then what about the wrapping? Over here, maybe, Debbie, did you get to the wrapping? We said um, one of the, um, what could cause you, what could prevent you from wrapping the sandwich? We said you didn't have any wrap. Or the other one was if your baggie was too small right. and you're trying to stuff that sandwich in. It gets all squished. Yeah. So we said um, severity was a five, because some people don't like squished sandwiches. <laughs> and the causes are, you know, goes back to the same thing. Yeah. You didn't go to the store to get the right size baggie, you know, things right. like that. Well, you forgot the shirt. Right. Does anybody else have anything additional under the wrapping? Aluminum oil versus plastic, right? <laughs> All right. Well, great, great, um, great job, great effort. I appreciate everybody's input on this because, like you said, you you can start seeing how it could translate. You also can see how this could take hours to do. You know, when we did an instrument at a time, after the process, after the training, after the process mapping. They met in one to two hour increments just to get through those steps because there is a lot of discussion, especially people who do a very complex process. Um, you know, with the medical instruments, it was there was a lot of manual steps in addition to the instruments, so there was twofold on that one. Can you think of any other applications? You know, Carrie and I gave you some examples of how we've used the FMEA. Has anybody ever used it? Or used it in a different way. You have your I've used the MF for me. I know you talk about some greenbelt projects you've done. Well, that was on a new process. Always on a new process. I use it in, <coughs> in the supply chain when we have suppliers that are not performing well. Okay. So you know when you go in there, you know they like to say we're not broken until you get down on the floor and you start using that, and then all of a sudden it becomes very apparent that they are broken. And, so, and then it kind of goes, takes its own life from there. So did you hear us use it on suppliers? So the, question, the big question I have, I haven't used it, but I'm anxious to try it, is these, these failures that you come up with to start the process, mm -hmm. is it purely like 
in a brainstorming session, or is it something you could take from, let's say, a complaint database or a defect list? But if it's an older process that you're looking at, you can have the data. And that will help you prioritize. That would reduce the subjectivity of the other management. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Like with the testing platforms that we did, you know, we had data. We know, you know we knew how many complaints we got on that. But on that particular project that what prompted that general manager to say that it wasn't those instruments she had a problem, she had a couple of other ones that were just making her concern. You know, here's two separate ones. Is it <coughs> all my all the, all my processes or not? So we knew how many errors had come out from our data, but we wanted to kind of look and get the information. But yeah, absolutely. So I would say in a newer process, you don't have as much data to begin with, but on a um, but you can you can still get some kind of uh, so interesting standards too. Point, though, in the case you just cited, though, you would take it occurrences that actually occurred. And you're extrapolating them onto possibilities of, of other. We also didn't have any tests on that particular platform we did, so we knew what the potential was as well. So you know, so that helped us because it was an existing process. So you know, instruments we did had different testing, so we had different volume of testing based on that. So that's uh, also helped. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any other comments? Oh. What is the unknown size? How many is too few? How many is too many? How many is too few for what? Uh, 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 uh,
you're going to want to go, how does that affect your FMEA? Or on the output on the other side, we got rid of all the plastic bags, we're only doing tinfoil now. How is that affecting it? So anytime you make an input-output change, or you change the process, it's almost like you're doing a new FMEA anyway. You're actually creating a new... You're doing, you're, you're changing the process. You're altering the process. You're altering what you did your test on, so you've got to go on a week. And that can be once a year, once 10 years. Or if you say, okay, now we're going to make 50 sandwiches at lunch instead of one, because you're doing it at a dorm or camp, you're going to have to figure something else out. That's a great thing. It's just even think about the jelly, what you're saying. If you get a bigger jar, your, your spoilage might be more, or you may have to go to the store less often. It's going to have any anything that you change in your process is going to have it. Great, great, thank you. Okay, does it have, now has anybody else used any of the risk tools that they'd like to share with us? We always like to learn new things. No? Has anybody ever used the FMEA before? Yes, a couple. Great, great. Um, this is the web, the website <coughs> that is out there. You can, you can also uh, do a search on ASQ. That's the reference. Uh, what was that? The um, what was the process that went through there? Uh, ATM. Oh, an ATM. Yeah. So they have another nice, good example. Uh, we'll we'll be providing these slides, so they'll be out there. Yeah, they have, a, they have an example of an ATM, and one of the things that could happen that they identified was that um, it, the cash could um, crumple and get stuck in the machine. And they said that they, the detection was that they have a um, alarm, that if that happens, it alarms. But they, they rated that a 10 of, um, in detection. So I said to Megan, does, like, their, does, their, does it really stink? They're <laughs> like, why is that a 10? I wasn't sure. Maybe they just made a mistake in their, in their FMBA. But um, it's a decent example. It's about an ATM. And, uh, and uh, you know, they talk about things that would be bad, running out of cash and stuff like that. So it's pretty good. Plus, it has um, a lot of the things that we talked about today about the benefits and um, why you might want to use it. Always good to reference ASQ. They have a pretty good website. They have a lot of good things, um, and this comes right up. You don't have to sign in or anything, which is nice. You get the uh, information. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. I hope uh, all of you um, benefited from this. I know from the discussion and from the interaction, um, it was quite useful. What we'd like to do is. Um, for you to provide us feedback. So uh, when you attend these events and you go back to your uh, companies and, and you implement this process or uh, you try to use some of the things you've learned here, uh, we would like to hear back. And one of the ways by which you can tell us is uh, if you want to write an article for our newsletter. Our newsletter is something that's published every quarter. It's called the Quality Islander. Uh, many of you may have seen that on our website. So we really like more participation from our members. Um, so we would welcome any articles or anything that you want to write or provide us in terms of feedback. Um, another thing is that uh, you know membership in ASQ has a lot of benefits. I'm sure most of you here are members, but if any of you are not, uh, we encourage you, I encourage you to become members. And when you do become a member, specify Section 303, the Long Island section, as your primary section. Um, sometimes, based on the zip code or based on your address, you automatically get assigned to another section. We want you here, so if you do sign up, um, please uh, specify that. Um, and another thing where we've had a lot of success, and where we've been quite active is in our uh, certification prep courses. Um, we've had quite a few uh, this year. It's always been sold out. We've had uh, very good results in terms of people who took those certification courses, appeared for the exams, and our passing percentage is much, much higher than the national average. Um, and we have Eric here, who's one of our instructors. He does a great job. Um, and one of the courses coming up, Eric, if I'm not mistaken, is the CMQ OE uh, prep course. 
Has it started or when does it start? It starts in a month. It uh, starts Tuesday, July 22nd. It runs for 11 consecutive weeks from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Uh, the exam is Saturday, October 4th. And um, registration is going on right now. You can go to the ASQ Long Island webpage and register for the class. Uh, and if there are any other certifications, courses, that you would like us to offer, uh, you can go to our website. Uh, there is a way by which you can pre-register or request a course, uh, so please do so. Um, and again, uh, thank you all for uh, coming uh, and participating in this. Uh, and uh, it was great having you all. Uh, thank you.